And uh, my name's Dr. Katherine Wessinger. I'm a professor of the history of religions at Loyola University, New Orleans. And um, I'm going to uh, introduce the uh, panelists very briefly. Um, so this is um, David Thibodeau, a Branch Davidian survivor, author, and speaker. And over there, the first gentleman there is Stuart Wright. He's a sociologist at uh, Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas. And there at the end is Dr. J. Philip Arnold. He's a historian with uh, the Reunion Institute in Houston. And so uh, the four of us are going to make statements. Dr. Arnold is going to make a statement for Dr. James Tabor, a Bible scholar who could not be here today. And uh, our statements are going to be very brief, and then we'll take questions from the press. And then uh, there'll be one last announcement after the questions are over and questions and answers are over. And we're aiming to start the memorial, the Branch Davidian Memorial, exactly at 11 or as close to 11 as we can. All right. So I'm going to make my statement first. And basically, it's a simple statement, or I've got a, uh, it's a series of um, statements that, um, that about points that I think are very important about this case that very often people in general and journalists oft often miss. So I'll go ahead with that. So the first thing, the first point I want to make is that the man who lives at Mount Carmel Center at the present time was never a member of David Koresh's group known as the Branch Davidians. It is misleading when a reporter writes that this individual is the current Bra Branch Davidian pastor unless the article clarifies that he has no connection to the David Koresh Branch Davidian group. So that's the first statement I want to make. The second statement that I want to make is that David Koresh's statutory rape of underage girls did not come under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, whose agents attempted to execute a dynamic entry on February 28, 1993, resulting in the deaths of four ATF agents and six Branch Davidians with many wounded. And I want to go on and explain that in 1992, Texas Child Protective Services investigated the Branch Davidians for child abuse and closed the case for lack of evidence. The Branch Davidians federal agents conflict in 1993 was interactive with multiple parties interacting with each other. The interactions between federal agents, the news media, and the Branch Davidians produced the final outcome, which was the fire on April 19, 1993. News stories labeling the Branch Davidians with the dehumanizing and stigmatizing word cult contributed to a social context in which federal agents carried out unnecessary aggressive actions against the Branch Davidians. FBI agents took over the case on March 1st, and as a result of FBI investigation, FBI decision makers knew about the Branch Davidians' apocalyptic theology of martyrdom, and as it was taught by David Koresh. Nevertheless, every time Branch Davidians cooperated and adults came out of the residence, the FBI's hostage rescue team punished the Branch Davidians inside the building by using tanks to run over or crush their vehicles or move their vehicles, by shining bright spotlights all night long at them, and uh, also by blasting high decibel sounds uh, around the clock at them. So the hostage rescue team was uh, uh, engaging in what is called uh, stress escalation, which is not conducive to negotiations, and FBI negotiators know that. A total of 21 children were sent out in the early part of the siege, and a total of 14 adults came out by March 23rd. All right, so now turning to April 19th, I want to say that CS gas, which is tear gas, is intended for outdoor use only. It's not supposed to be used indoors in enclosed spaces. On April 19th, 1993, after a five and a half hour tank and CS gas assault against the Branch Davidians who were remaining in the residence, a member of the FBI's hostage rescue team um, who was driving a combat engineering vehicle was ordered to drive the CEV into the center of the building and spray CS gas toward the open doorway of a concrete room in which mothers, two pregnant women, and young children were sheltered. 
This task was completed at 11.49 a.m. After the same CEV was driven to the southeast corner of the building and sprayed CS gas into the second floor window there, the first flames became visible at 12.07 p.m. And fire quickly consumed the building, as we all saw on television. 76 people died in the fire. 22 children, aged 13 and younger, seven teenagers, and 47 adults. These numbers include two pregnant women and their babies who were inside that concrete room uh, that was gassed by CS. Nine people managed to escape the fire. So those are my brief statements, and I'll be happy to take questions later. And if anybody wants to see my, any of my publications, uh, uh, you can um, look at my academia.edu page under Katherine Westinger. So the next person will be Dr. Stuart Wright. If you could come up here. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Stuart Wright. I, I'm professor and chair of the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice at Lamar University in Beaumont. Um, I'm going to read you um, a statement um, and then read from uh, actually the government report, the final government report on Waco. So 30 years removed from the deadly siege and standoff at Mount Carmel, there's still a lot of misinformation and competing narratives attempting to define, revise, and redefine these events. Since I only have seven minutes to speak, I thought it would remind us, remind our audience that uh, Congress conducted its own exhaustive investigation into Waco and produced a readily available report in 1996. You can ac access on that online. Uh, I testified the first day of those congressional hearings. Uh, so I'm going to read from the executive summary of the report, just a few key findings, um, just to remind us what, uh, uh, what was uh, learned. <clears throat> uh, under th on page three, under the subtitle Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF's investigation of the Branch Davidians was grossly incompetent. It lacked the minimum professionalism expected of a major federal law enforcement agency. While the ATF had probable cause to obtain the arrest warrant for David Korish and the search warrant for the Branch Davidian residents, the affidavit filed in support of the warrants contained an incredible number of false statements. The ATF agents responsible for preparing the affidavits knew or should have known that many of the statements were false. If David Korish could have been arrested outside the Davidian residence, the ATF chose not to arrest Korish outside the Davidian residence and instead were determined to use a dynamic entry approach. In making this decision, ATF agents exercised extremely poor judgment, made erroneous assumptions, and ignored the foreseeable perils of their course of action. The decision to pursue a military-style raid was made more than two months before surveillance, undercover, and infiltration efforts were even begun. The ATF undercover and surveillance operation lacked the minimum professionalism expected of a federal law enforcement agency. Supervisors failed to properly monitor the operation. The ATF's raid plan for February 28th was significantly flawed. The plan was poorly conceived, utilized a high-risk tactical approach when other tactics could have been successfully used, was drafted and commanded by ATF agents who were less qualified than other available agents, and used agents who were not sufficiently trained for the operation. Under the subheading, the Department of Justice. The decision by Attorney General Janet Reno to approve the FBI's plan to end the standoff on April 19th was premature, wrong, and highly irresponsible. The Attorney General knew or should have known that the plan to end the standoff would endanger the lives of the Davidians inside the residence, including the children. The Attorney General knew or should have known that there was little risk to the FBI agents, to society as a whole, and the possibility of a peaceful resolution continued to exist. And then under the subheading, Federal Bureau of Investigation, the CS riot control agent assault on April 19th should not have taken place. The possibility of a negotiated end to the standoff presented by Corus should have been pursued, even if it had taken several more weeks. 
The FBI should have sought and accepted more expert advice on the Branch Davidians and their religious views and more open-minded to the advice of their own FBI experts. FBI tactical commander Jeffrey Jamar and senior FBI and justice officials advising the Attorney General knew or should have known that none of the reasons given to end negotiations and go forward with the plan to end the standoff on April 19th had merit. The CS riot control agent is capable of causing immediate, acute, and severe physical distress to pregnant women, the elderly, and those with respiratory conditions. In some cases, severe or extended exposure can lead to incapacitation. Evidence presented to the subcommittees show that the use of CS riot control agent in enclosed spaces, such as the bunker, significantly increased the possibility that lethal levels would be reached and the possibility of harm significantly increases. And they conclude by saying this. Evidence does indicate that the CS insertion into the enclosed bunker at a time when women and children were assembled inside could have been a proximate cause of or directly resulted in some or all of the deaths attributed to asphyxiation and the autopsy reports. Police officers are sworn to protect and serve. They're expected to uphold the rights of the accused, to respect citizens' presumption of innocence, and to treat people with dignity. There are also constitutional protections and legislative guarantees in place in a democratic society designed to restrain police in the use of unnecessary and excessive force. This calamity could have been avoided through better investigative work and planning, and whatever crimes David Kors and others may or may not have committed, this deadly disaster was entirely preventable. Thank you. Greetings, everyone, on this auspicious occasion. Dr. James Tabor from the University of uh, North Carolina at Charlotte wishes he could be here today, but for some personal reasons, he just could not make it. So I'm going to spend a few minutes presenting some of the things that he wanted to give you today. And the best way that we can do that is if I can uh, simply refer you to this particular handout. And there are a hundred of them or so on that back table. And uh, for the major media, we do have some, uh, the media, uh, all the media in here, we do have some uh, media kits that Wendy, Wendy, could you raise your hand? Those, th they will be available to you or to anyone who would like to see them in which this paper and some others all gathered together uh, but anyone can go back and sample some of the sheets in the back that will give you some source material. But Dr. Tabor provided this 10 neglected aspects <clears throat> of the 1993 Waco tragedy. 10 neglected aspects. What are those 10? He lists them and discusses them one by one. So when you get this in your hand, you can sit and read these 10 neglected aspects. Let me give you a sampling. One of them is the raid itself. Why the raid took place, how the raid could have been avoided. He explains that here in number one. In number two, the arms. Why did the Branch Davidian Church have weapons? He will explain that in point two. In point three, the assault itself looking at exactly what happened on the 28th. On the fourth one, the community. What is the Branch Davidian community? Dr. Tabor is not a Branch Davidian. I'm not a Branch Davidian, but we recognize it to be a religious community. Here, in this point, Jim will explain exactly what kind of community it was and what it means to be a religious community. What is that? Is that a church? What is that exactly? He goes into that here in point uh, number four. 
Then also the 51 day standoff, he discusses that also for you. What happened during the 51 day standoff? Where they were on the telephone every day with the FBI. Those are called the negotiation tapes. I've heard every one of them. Dr. Tabor has too. That's 51 days, 10 hours, 12 hours, 15 hours a day. It took a couple of years for me to gain access to them and to hear them. And the same for Dr. Tabor. He discusses that in point five. Point six, he discusses the exit plan. There was a plan for the Branch Davidians to leave Mount Carmel. A plan that would have worked, he discusses that in point six. In point seven, he discusses what happened with Janet Reno. When the FBI went to speak to Janet Reno, what did they say to her? What did they not say to her? He gives a fair and just overview of what happened there. And then he talks about the, the apocalypse. Were the Branch Davidians planning to kill themselves? Were they all brainwashed? And David Koresh knew that he was going to die and it was inevitable. He discusses that. And I'm going to have a few things to say about that myself in a moment. What is the Seven Seals manuscript that David was writing? Dr. Tabor will give you a quick overview of that. What is this promise that David says, we're all coming out. God has shown me I gotta write my message. Dr. Tabor will talk about that. And then he'll have a few comments about the fire itself that took place. Dr. Tabor was involved from the very beginning back in early March of 1993. He and I had seen this on television and since my PhD was on the history of apocalyptic groups, I saw immediately <coughs> that the characters of my dissertation had come alive on the television and in Waco. It was as if some of these early apocalyptic groups were on television there. David is talking about the book of Revelation. He's explaining the book of Daniel, the 1335 prophecy of Daniel 12, the 1290 prophecy, the time and time and half a time prophecy. He knew all these things. And I recognized that. I said, this man is very serious. And I can tell you this, the cops are not going to understand what he's saying. So there's two trains coming down the track. There's going to be a collision. So I called Dr. Tabor, Jim, my friend. I said, what are we going to do? We've got to do something. We can't just sit here and watch it on television when we know what happens with, with apocalyptic groups. You know the story, don't you, of Masada, the Jews fighting the Romans? Well, they were apocalyptic also. What about Joan of Arc having mystical visions that she should go out and kill Englishmen, lead soldiers to kill Englishmen? That's a pretty radical thing, and she's burned up. So there's something when, when the governments encounter these apocalyptic mystical types that bad things can happen. So knowing that, I drove to Waco to talk to the FBI to say, can I help interpret this religious language? Can I, I know a little bit about the book of Revelation. What can I do to help you to understand it? In other words, can I give you intel to help you to resolve this crisis peacefully? So Dr. Tabor and I worked on that together. We tried our best to contact the FBI and give them this information, but they were just not interested. Now that was the old FBI. They, they were not interested in hearing the religious interpretations of David. Isn't that right, Dave? Isn't that right, Dave? They, they were not interested in that, and they were not interested in taking what I had to say seriously. So we had a real problem there. That was the old FBI. We saw some changes a few years later at Montana with the new FBI under Louis Free and Robin Montgomery uh, and, and others, uh, uh, Gary Neusner, came to an understanding that you have to use sometimes worldview translators to help resolve crises with ideologically motivated groups. And the same with the media at that time. The, me the old media then, they were all into this talk about cults and being brainwashed. They were not interested in hearing about this group really does believe the book of Daniel. They study the book of Revelation more than you get on, the, on Sunday school at the Baptist church. God bless the Baptists, but you're not going to have the minister talking about the prophecies of 
Daniel 12 and how it correlates to the prophecies of the seven seals. You just don't get that. These were students of the seven seals, Bible students. They wanted to learn the Greek, the Hebrew, see what the rabbis say. They're studying this material. That's what you were dealing with. The media, the old media, didn't appreciate that. But now we have the new media. The media that's here today, you have a chance to do something different. Now you have the internet. Now you have these sources. Look at these sources you have. We have right here uh, something really important. We have what David wrote. Right here it is as the, the seven seals. He wrote this manuscript. You can find it. This is just one page, but you can find the whole 20-something page thing online. The media can now explore these things. You can actually find the negotiation tapes online, and you can listen, read 51 days and get at the meat of what was really happening. You don't have to believe the exaggerations of the old media. The new modern media has access to social media, to the internet, to get at the truth of what really happened back then. So what am I going to say to you today that's new? Well, in my closing three or four minutes, uh, I want to say this, that there were, there were two opportunities that we have to realize were very important. I'm just going to do them for memory. But we know on March 15th, Steve Schneider, David's right-hand man, heard me on the radio talking about the seven seals. He calls the FBI and he says, we heard this guy on the radio. He seems to know a little bit about the seven seals. Hey, if we can speak to him and he can talk and he can show David Koresh something that David doesn't know, we are out of here. He uses that term, out of here. The FBI, excuse me, the FBI does not put me in contact. They refuse to do that. They don't let me talk. So they would rather, this is the old FBI I'm talking about, agents that are here today, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about what happened back 30 years ago. They did not do that. Instead, they would prefer to send CS gas in before they would let me talk as Steve requested. March 15th. What happened on April 10th? to the 13th. Then, at that time, the FBI finds a book in the library because I told them about it on the news media, and they found there was another man who had changed his name to Koresh about 100 years before. And their idea was, David, do you know about this earlier person from 100 years ago? And David says, no, I don't know anything about it. Steve said, we don't know anything about it. Please send that book in. We'd like to find out if there's somebody else called Koresh. And the FBI refused to send the book in. Why would that have been important? Well, if, if, if the book had gone in there, some of the members, maybe not Dave, maybe others, would have said, you know, this is, this is pretty unusual. David, did, did, you didn't plagiarize that, did you? David said, no, I didn't I know anything about it. But it would have caused some doubt in some members. And maybe a few people would have come out and surrendered and been saved and not, not died later. So that was a missed opportunity. You would send that book in. The third thing I'll close with is on April 14th. I have the letter for you. It's back there. This is the letter that David Koresh wrote. He signed it. What does it say? It says, we are coming out. We had a waiting period. But God has told us the waiting period is over with. It's over with. We rejoiced. Tabor and I, we thought, this is great. Dick DeGarren, the attorney, other scholars, we were very happy to find out that the waiting period was over. And now David is coming out. He said, I just have to write my message. I write my message to the seven seals, and we all will come out. David will testify. He's an eyewitness, and he's going to speak now, and he will testify to all these things that he saw. The Branch Davidians were going to surrender. They were coming out. The letter of April 14th says, that manuscript will be given to his attorney and to Phil Arnold and Jim Tabor. And the FBI said, the old FBI said, oh, yeah, we can wait. But they didn't. They did not wait. 
It's a sad thing. So why did the FBI not understand? Why did the media not understand? Because religious language is the language that the Branch Davidians were speaking. If they were Russian terrorists, then they would have brought in a Russian translator. They needed to bring in worldview <coughs> translators to explain what the Branch Davidians were teaching. Some of you are English majors. I know some of you journalists in here. If you're reading Edgar Allan Poe and the Raven says, never more, never more, you've got to understand what does that mean in the context of that literature, right? You have to interpret it. Well, David is using the Bible as his means of communication. It has to be interpreted. Big mistake by the old FBI and the media. They did not include that. Now, we have an eyewitness. I'm going to get out of the way, and he'll come up and speak. And you're doing great. <laughs> no, no, no. You're the man. You're, you're the eyewitness. But then we will answer any question in the world that you would like to ask us. That was wonderful. I don't want to follow Phil right now. That was, that was very good. Thank you. All of you, thank you so much, Stuart. You know I love your work. And, uh, Kathy Westinger has helped us every year put these on, the memorials where we can get here and remember our friends who are no longer with us. And you guys are just such a blessing. And I just thank you for all of the years, all you've done, all your work. Bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to say, and I'm not even kidding. Usually I prepare for these things. It's been, um, it's been a crazy year, huh? Crazy last couple of years. COVID, everything we've all gone through. Now here we are. I think I'm going to pick up with something that uh, Phil Arnold said about the new FBI and especially the new media. That's something I'm going to be reflecting on now for a very long time, that this, this, things are new now, and, and they should be. Listen, we have all this technology, we have all, all, all these wonders. We have access to every piece of information that's ever been written since the beginning of time. And yet, confusion seems to be worse than ever. We don't seem to be analyzing the proper information. We still got the extreme right saying this, the extreme left saying that, and the majority of the people in the center are trying to figure out what's true, what's right, what's going on here. I recently read some of the new Waco book, I, well, one and a half of the new books that have come out and some of the new information that people are writing. Uh, and I, I'm not impressed. I'm not going to mention the gentleman's name or the gentleman's book. But in one particular book, in the very first chapter, he names an ATF agent whose job it was to go up to the dogs during the initial raid with a fire extinguisher, like you're going to put the dogs out and get the dogs to go back. 30 years later, he, and this is just so irresponsible for journalists, is still using the same propaganda that they used at that, for that terrible movie Ambush at Waco that was made where they go after the dogs with the fire extinguisher. People, let's be, let's be real. They came in and they shot the dogs first thing, the five Alaskan Malamutes in a penned up area. That's how they do it. This is what the militaristic ATF does. They go in and they take the dogs out. Let's not be, let's not be deceived. Let's not be fooled. You can interview all the ATF and FBI guys you want, all right, as a journalist. If you're going to continue to put in false propaganda, you are the part of the problem in this country. And you're the reason that we are so close it's what literally could be a civil war. It's incredibly irresponsible. It, it lacks any kind of professional merit whatsoever. And it makes me wonder, is that what they want? Is that what you, you members of the press, that, do you want to headline that bad where you want fellow Americans to start shooting fellow Americans in the name of, of an ideology? It's, I, I just can't, I can't believe what I'm seeing. <laughs> I can't believe what I'm seeing. I had a long talk with Paul Fatta, one of the survivors, um, yesterday. We had a dinner. And one of the things we talked about is in our experience, the people that we have met through it. Guess what? Some of those people were in militias. Some of those people had, um, were in, in civil rights groups, guns rights groups. You name it. We've met, we've met I've met the greatest people on the face of the earth, literal angels on this earth, and I've met some devils along the way, too. We tend to stay with the, with the angels, hopefully. But the point is this. 
what the mainstream, mainstream press, especially back then, no, now too, wants to demonize, they're demonizing your fellow Americans. It's not just the liberal elite that live in New York and LA, guys, there's a whole country, and those are real people. And you know what? They're working two jobs to barely get by and get their kids into school, right? And do the right thing as a person, as an American, pay their taxes. And you look down at them because they live in the South or they think this or they're simple. I mean, this is a problem that I think highly educated people have, and especially the way it's looked at. And again, you get that demonization, that demonization. It's like, these are people. As the Davidians were people. The people that died at Mount Carmel were people. They've never been truly humanized until they did, they did the, the Waco series. And it was the first time I'd ever seen the people inside there humanized. That's all we've ever wanted was to tell the stories of the people. And that's why these memorials are so special. So you get to see each individual and you get to find out who they really were. I was going to get up here and I was going to talk about uh, some very political things and, and some of the lies. I think scholars have done that quite well. I want to talk about the people today because that really is what, what it's all about. And that's, what, that's what's going to happen here after this press conference. But I am very concerned. And I'm just uh, since the press is here, um, two things I want to say before I forget. One is the, uh, there was a recent documentary that's out. And uh, right before, right after that, I'm called a liar by uh, some members of the FBI, which is the same thing they said 20 years ago. I was, people asked, asked me, what do you think, the FBI calling you a liar? It's like, I feel it's like that's the master saying when you can take this pebble from my hand, you can go on about your life. And so like I, I took the pebble out of their hand. Like they're calling me a liar. These people and during the 51 days lied completely to you over and over again. And they started with the dogs. They started with the ambush at Waco, the ATF propaganda film. Make no mistake, that's what it was. They went after those dogs and they shot those dogs. Some of the indications from some of the witnesses that were there, um, some of the agents actually said, we feel that the first shots were them fire shooting the dogs. And then they retracted their statement when that came to Congress. Another agent said to the Texas Rangers, I reached for my gun and it went off and I feel like that was the first shot. Retracted his statement when he had to stand for Congress. So it didn't happen because 10 years passed, or so, however many years, <laughs> the first thing you tend to say is, tends to be the truth, right? So anyway, they can say what they want. I don't care what the pressure is. They can call me a liar all they want. I just ask if you think that, that you at least read my book. If you don't want to support me, get it from the library. But do a little research, please. Listen to the scholars, listen to the truth, find out that truth for yourself. Don't let Fox News tell you what to think and don't let MSNBC tell you what to think. They all, got a, they all have agendas. Remember one more thing, it's two more things. It'll probably be three. <laughs> <coughs> all of you, all these cameras and all the people in every newspaper, magazine and, and everything you see on television, it's all, all of the media is controlled by two or three companies. I think it's two now, could be three. So just think, let's say it's three companies. Three companies control everything that we digest. That's a power, that's, that's power. And it's a powerful thought, and I want you all to think about that. So, I learned more about America going overseas than, than I have being here. We think we have freedom of the press, we think we got a pretty good beat on things. We don't, guys. You gotta spend a lot of time doing a lot of research to really see what's happening here. That's all I have to say, don't be deceived, okay? Um, yes. Thank you, God, thank you. I was in the courtroom in 2000 when the uh, civil trial took place. Uh, the Branch Davidian survivors and their families uh, brought suit against the government for wrongful death. Uh, an ATF agent was uh, called to the stand and under oath, he was part of the dog team and he m admitted that they fired first, they, they killed the dogs first. The first shots fired at Mount Carmel were, was the ATF dog team. Under oath, he said that, I heard him. So I'll just to put that to rest. Thank you. Thank you. And here's why that's important. I know a lot of people 
that are on Team Puppy <laughs> rather than Team Human. Seriously. I know a lot of people that would die for their pets, for their animals. And I, I understand it. Your, your, your pets, your dogs, your cats, they're, they're members of your family. And imagine you just finished breakfast and some guy dressed in a black outfit comes with a gun and shoots that member of your family. How is that going to start your day off? What kind of reaction are you as a, a person going to give to that person trying to come through your door? It's not a very good way to start a communication, especially with a group of people who you claim are fanatical and have a lot of firearms. One more, <laughs> it's going to be a couple points. But when we were talking about the psychops, when Stuart was talking about the psychops and the speaker systems and the sound systems that they set up during the siege where they're trying to keep us up 24 seven, that's very powerful. Having no sleep, right? Looking at that speaker and thinking, I would love to shoot that speaker out to shut that up right now, but then not doing it because you know that's gonna give them an excuse to do what they really want and come in and shoot you. So nobody, I want to say, nobody inside that building, despite being harassed consistently, day in, day out, shot at those speakers. We didn't do anything aggressive. At every single step of this, the government were the aggressors. From coming in, they were invited onto the property through David to check all of the yellow sheets through Henry McMahon. He invited the ATF onto the property. All could have been avoided, absolutely. <laughs> Came in shooting the dogs. The helicopters at the back were shooting. I know every agent says the helicopters were not firing, but there were people, I believe, that there were agents on that helicopter that were. I saw the evidence of that in, the, um, in one of the water tanks that was in front of Winston Blake's door. Winston Blake was killed, eating his breakfast. We know Peter Gent. There's a video. I, I think it's on Waco New Revelation. I'll have to check that. He goes up. You see a helicopter fly by the water tank. You see a figure come up on the top of the water tank and then fall right back down as if he's been shot. It appears that is from the air. There is a, an ATF agent who says that he saw Peter come up and shot him from the ground. That's his testimony. I call anyone a liar, it could be true. But I believe that those helicopters fired into the building. I saw the evidence in the sheetrock, in the, in, the, in the ceiling, in the roof. I saw the evidence in the, in, in, in the water tank. And I'll never forget Kevin Whitecliffe coming up to me that morning after the ceasefire, yelling and screaming. They came in shooting. I said, yeah, that all started from the front. That's what it sounded like to me being in the cafeteria. Kevin was out the back, and Kevin said, no. And he's screaming and yelling it very passionately. This is not someone who was lying to me. He says, no, the helicopters came in shooting. I saw them come in and shoot at us. And I'm like, what do you mean? From the back? He said, yes. So he was adamant that helicopters were coming and shooting from the back. They still claim the helicopters weren't shooting. I just don't believe it. I guess, yeah, one more thing, and then I got one more. And I just want to talk about the pyrotechnic devices. The FBI claims that these pyrotechnic devices were all used in the underground shelter. Here's the problem I have with that. Then why'd you lie about it for three years? Three years, the FBI said consistently no pyrotechnic devices were used in that building, that the CS gas canisters and rounds that were used were non-pyrotechnic, non-lethal. Well, we know CS gas, the methylene chloride is the propellant for the CS gas, so methylene chloride is something that is used in um, uh, paint thinner. So I, I'm not a scientist. I don't know technically how flammable or not flammable methylene chloride is, but I suspect there. But for sure, the six or seven devices that were mislabeled as silencers were pyrotechnic. They absolutely could start fires. So you could tell me they were using the underground shelter, but I, I just don't believe you. You've lost your credibility with me. For three years, you said there were no pyrotechnics used in that building at all, and yet here they are. So yeah, I, I those, the, the title of this was 30 years on, what have we learned from Waco? Well, for me, these same questions that I continue to bring up have not been answered properly. And every single documentary out there gets it wrong especially some of the newer ones. 30 years later, they can't include all of the facts that these scholars have talked about, that we have put together forever, that we know are true. We know all these things happened. And you still don't have a definitive documentary 
that shows exactly what happened on both sides. And mistakes were made on both sides. Okay, Koresh is no saint. And I'm not sitting here trying to glorify anyone, and I'm not trying to say that mistakes, terrible mistakes weren't made on both sides because they were. But it's time to start thinking clearly and, 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 and rationing the truth for what it is. And that's it. I, I would just like to see all of these things come out. And the new media, I love that because it is. You guys are in a new place, even though you're, how do you say this tactfully? Oh. Even though you have a corporate master <laughs> that whips you all into shape, you still have a certain amount of power. And you, there are things you can say. You can still be a brave journalist. Hey, man, there's YouTube. There's all kinds of avenues to get around this. And that's what they're afraid of. We, don't, we no longer watch ABC, NBC, and CBS for all our news. There's Breaking Points, which I highly recommend. Anyone on YouTube, what, that's amazing, amazing news show. There's just... There's people that are trying to do it right. Those are the people we need to listen to. Thank you. I will conclude my portion of this thing. And now we're going to call up. Do you want to call? Yeah. You want to do it? Yeah. Kathy no. Wessinger. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, David Thibodeau. That was excellent. And uh, so <coughs> we have a little bit of time. We do want to start the memorial on time at 11 a.m., but do reporters have any questions they would like to ask any of us up here? Yes? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask as a group, um, obviously it's an important day here, also in Oklahoma City, where three years later the bombing happened. And what do you want people to see the importance of what happened in Waco in terms of what's happening today? That David just pointed out. Can I, can I say something about that? The extremism Thank on you. the side, the political yeah. violence. What is the message you want people to get from what happened? That is simple and what a great question. Thank you so much because I was going to address that. I, I was going to address it and I didn't. Thank you for that question. I know Kathy, Dana, Paul, Heather, Kevin, any of the survivors that went through this hell and still daily go through this hell. It's not over after Waco. Waco is with you every single day. You're shaving, you're brushing your teeth, Waco's there. Someone cuts you off and you get way angrier than you should, Waco's there. It's always with us. But guess what? I can tell you conclusively, the only thing that I agree with the federal government on is none of us want anybody to do any violence in the name of our group or, or the violence that the ATF and the FBI perp uh, perpetrated and the lies that they're continuing to tell. Please do not take justice into your own hands and hurt innocent people. That is absolutely the worst thing you can do. Nobody wants that. Thank you. Please write your senator or congressman, even though I don't really believe that's going to work. Um, contact us through the website, wacosurvivors.com. We'll talk with you or work with you. I have, there's a lot of people that I know are very depressed, very sad, and very angry that reach out to me all the time. And the best part of this for me is I get to talk to those people and say, you're not alone. And don't do anything stupid. I love you. And the people that I know that survived this love you. And if we can still go through this, then you can too. You can go through whatever pain you're having. We'll get you help. You know, I can point you in directions, books to read, things that you can help yourself. Just don't take all that anger and use it against innocent people. That's it. Oh, she wants me to ask you if uh, you have any other questions. Yeah, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> just, just try, just, you know, do the sniff test, man. If it sounds a little bit too radical on any side, there's probably another side that needs to be considered. Uh, what was the first thing you said? Because that was... Um, pretty much saying, uh, why is now the time to... Great, that's great. Because we're in danger of a civil war. 
And I never thought that I would live to see the anger, the miscommunication that we're in right now, the strife between the sides. But, I mean, I love this country. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but I love this country. I was born here. I was brought up here. Every time I go out and, and I meet someone on the street, how are you today? How are you today? It's, it's, people are beautiful. Many people can, okay, recently if you read the social media, you get a lot of haters out there, you get a lot of trolls. You just, you can't listen to the comments sometimes. People just, they're going to hate to hate. Those are the ones that have the biggest mouths, unfortunately. Just, you know, I don't think I know how to answer your question. Just do, uh, you know, I, I know how to answer your question. I'll, I'll give you an example. I thought that after this documentary that happened, that it, it was going to change everything. You know, all, all the stuff that, 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 that the series did in humanizing people. And there's a faction of them trying to change it around again and kind of blame all the survivors for even being there. And, um, but I did a recent interview with uh, NPR in Houston. And if they don't change what I said, the questions were phenomenal. And I was able to go very deep with this particular journalist, and, and, and it went very smoothly and very well. The questions were far better than they were 20, 30 years ago. So I think you are learning. I think we all are learning. And we're learning to, here's what it is. Put yourself in the other person's shoes before you judge them. Put yourself in their shoes and try to figure out why did they go through this? Who is this person really before I say that they're a cultist or before I say that they're right wing or they're left wing? Try to figure out why it is they feel the way they do. You might be surprised at the answer and it might change your article for the better. That's what I've discovered. Yes, please. Great. To respond directly to your question about how the new media can be more assured of getting accurate information. Well, as a historian, we look for what? Primary sources. You use primary sources. So the negotiation tapes, 51 days of phone conversations between the Branch Davidians and the FBI, those are primary sources. Now, on that back table, I don't have all 51 days of negotiations. What I've given you are about six portals, single sheets, that if you go back and take them with you and you look at them, they will lead you to a treasure trove of information. So if you really want to do a program, write a book, do an article, then you go to those primary sources. They're available. I, I, I give them to you. Why are they available now? They, they existed back then, but now with, with the internet and with the computerized systems we have, with all this that's going on now, there's really no excuse. It's all there for you. Go, and you'll be amazed. I have to say this. Can you imagine, because I'm a historian and I like to study apocalyptic groups and mystics, Joan of Arc. Go, go back to her. I've always liked her. So you go back to Joan of Arc. Here she is believing that she has these voices directing her to do something for the kingdom of France, right? You know the story. You probably saw the movie The Messenger. Well, in that movie and in history, she believes she has this. Then she's captured and she's on trial. We don't have any recordings of what she said iPhones were not invented in 1400. We don't have any videos or audios. But David Koresh also believed that he could hear revelations from heaven. Not every day, not all the time, but occasionally he believed he could. That doesn't mean we believe Joan of Arc really did or David really did, but they believed it. But we don't have any recordings of Joan of Arc, but we have recordings of David explaining to the FBI that the reason we're going to wait is because God has revealed that to us. 
that's primary source material to get at what David is actually saying. Whereas what you hear in those days in the old media was, oh, he says he's God. No, he doesn't say he's God. He says that he does receive these messianic visions. Anyway, go to the primary sources. And you have portals back there for you. Stuart Wright, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Uh, one way you might get at the truth is, is to look at the uh, social science uh, peer-reviewed publications, right, where it has to go through vigorous peer review before you can get it in print, and I'm talking about professional journals, right? So Kathy and I and other, a group of scholars have for 30 years been doing a deep dive in this research. I've got a, a list of my publications which I'm happy to send you. Most of them are in PDF. If you reach out to me by email, I'll have, be happy to send uh, send you any anything that you ask for, but one of the pub I have a couple of publications here I'm, uh, that I brought that you can have access to, and one of them is a piece I published in the Journal of Terrorism and Political Violence, in which I identified 16 violations of the FBI's own protocols at Waco. Turns out that their their training for how to conduct a hostage barricade incident are superb. They've been teaching. Uh, police uh, from around the world at Quantico since uh, the, the 70s, the 1970s. And I thought maybe their playbook was, was uh, lousy, and it turns out they've got excellent research. But when they got to Waco, they threw the book out. 16 violations, right? So I had to come to the conclusion that it was a government massacre. Uh, what other conclusion do you come to? Uh, if you have one violation or two or three maybe, it's, it's incompetence or mistakes, but 16? I mean, you come to your own conclusion, and so I invite you to read the article and tell me, uh, you know, tell me if uh, my if my research is uh, on on spot, you know. Never so. offended by oh, we're never offended by questions. No. That's one of my favorite pieces of work too. Is by the way, what Stuart just mentioned. I highly recommend everyone read that. It's phenomenal. It's frightening. That was an excellent question. You, you can tell we all want to answer it. And, uh, and of course, we teach about this. You know, I have courses on religion and media, and I encourage my students to think critically about the media where they get information and analyze media critically, see what the agenda might be uh, with certain sources of media, and are they doing their deep investigation or not. So one of the things, because I'm looking at a lot of articles along with my students, one of the things that really annoys me is when I see reporters repeat old stories with old inaccuracies, and they just get repeated and repeated. And for the 30th anniversary, uh, which is now, today, uh, I saw one um, uh, news outlet, television news outlet from a large city and they just got, went back and got their all, all their old footage and their old uh, so-called cult experts, and then they repackaged it and then just, okay, this is our 30th anniversary story. There was no new research at all. So, um, and I want to reiterate that it's important to, yes, look at primary resources. I mean, in 93, the press conference, uh, the FBI and sometimes the ATF would give um, statements at press conferences and the majority of the reporters, and I'm told this by reporters on the site, that uh, they just took what the FBI was telling them, which was not the whole story or even the accurate story. But uh, one journalist did go out and um, did his own investigation, and that was Dick Revis. And he ended up publishing the first book on uh, what happened, which is titled The Ashes of Waco, and it's a very fine book. But um, so I understand that um, you might, reporters might not want to antagonize um, uh, important sources like government spokespersons, but there, there are other avenues of, of information. And, and then lastly, I'll say that uh, really check out the credentials of any experts that you consult, because when you have a story with an unconventional religious group, all the cult experts are gonna come out, and they did in 1993 in the subsequent years. And uh, those of us who are sociologists like Stuart, religious studies like myself, historians like uh, Phil, um, we, as I mentioned, you know, uh, 
we do, we've been studying this for 30 years. And, and we don't get paid, uh, we're, we're not paid to be called experts. We're paid to be historians and sociologists and re religious studies professors. And so we do this because we think it's important. And, and, and we have an obligation to teach not only our students, but the general public to the best we can. So really analyze uh, people you call, consult as so-called called experts. See if they have any credentials on the, on the topic that they're talking about. Okay. Um, we need, I think that was an excellent question. You gave us a lot to talk about. And I think, um, we need to, uh, before we wrap up this uh, press conference, there's um, a Branch Davidian survivor, Kathy Schroeder, and she wants to make a, a brief statement. And she'll not be taking questions afterwards. It's just a, her statement. Good morning. Good morning. I, I need to make a couple of statements. But first, I need to remind you that sometimes um, the way documentaries get uh, edited and sound bites get spliced together, it can make the words of the interviewee seem to have meaning that they were not originally intended to have. So I need to state for the record that I would never condone or excuse the sexual exploitation of anyone of any kind, regardless of age. Having been the victim of that myself at a tender young age of nine. So that's a horrible thought that can be said about me. Secondly, I do not agree with any violence of any kind against anyone. In my entire life, and I've been in the Air Force, guys, in my entire life, I have never fired a shot at any living being, not even an animal. I don't believe in violence. Thank you for your time. And because of recent events, I will not be speaking again publicly about the events in Waco in 1993. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy Schroeder. And um, so we're going to wrap up the, um, or this is the end of the press conference. And we need to uh, get started with the uh, uh, memorial section of this event. David Thibodeau will be moderating the mo memorial, and we're going to be streaming the memorial to Zoom. <coughs> and so during the memorial, you'll hear more statements from survivors. So if the press want to stay, you may stay. Uh, but if the press want to leave, this is the <coughs> time to leave, uh, because we're going uh, to get set up to uh, start the memorial. And, and, and right away. Okay. So thank you very much for coming here. We thank the press for listening to us. <laughs>